Good morning and welcome to our morning service uh, today. This is our carol service, so if you're visiting with us, we give you a very warm welcome. And uh, it's great to see you out. Just uh, a few announcements, uh, if that's okay. If you are visiting with us, uh, we'd ask you to stay behind for some refreshments after the morning service, an opportunity for us to chat and get to know you. Uh, that would be a bit better. I want to thank Roberta, who's playing for us today, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Roberta. Tonight, there is no evening service here in Strand. We've been invited to go to, to Knock, Knock Presbyterian, uh, for their carol service. And, uh, and so we say that we'd go along. So that's at half past six at Knock Presbyterian Church. If you would love to come but you have no transport, please speak to me afterwards and I'll arrange transport for you. This is Christmas week and so there's very little on. But there is a Christmas Day service, and the Christmas Day service is on at 10 o'clock on Friday morning. That's 10 o'clock. Uh, make sure you come along. It would be great to see you. It's important, isn't it, that we, we celebrate Christmas and we spell and celebrate the, the true meaning of Christmas. And the one way we do that, to remind ourselves of that, because Christmas Day tends to be really busy uh, doing lots of things with our family and our friends. But at the very beginning of the day, and 10 o'clock is the very beginning of the day for most of us, at the very beginning of the day, it's good that we come together, actually, and celebrate Christmas as the church family uh, here in Sydenham. And so, if you can come out, it'd be great to see you. I ask the boys and girls to bring their toys, and, uh, and we can put, not all your toys, but one of your <coughs> toys. And I'm changing the rule a wee bit. Uh, now that, because I'm the minister, I can do what I like. So I'm changing the rule. And the rule, particularly for those two guys in front here, the rule is no guns <laughs> this year, no guns. I still have the mark on my forehead. And so you can bring what you like, but no guns. And it'll be good to see you uh, this Christmas morning. The wee announcement sheet is really just to remind you of the Christmas Day service. And next Sunday is normal at half past ten. And there's no evening service the next Sunday night too, but we'll announce that next Sunday morning. So please take this away. It's really just to remind you that it's 10 o'clock uh, this Friday morning. Also, this is the last day for a Christmas card, uh, and so if you'd like to sign the, the Congregational Christmas card and give a donation towards cancer then, um, or the Marie Curie Centre, then uh, we would appreciate that. And the card is at the back. I think that's all uh, the announcements. As I say, today is, is we're going to sing lots of carols, uh, we're going to do lots of Bible readings, and today the, the Bible readings, the five Bible readings that we have, will be read by the Monday night uh, sewing group, and so various ladies will come up from that group uh, to, to do the reading. But our first carol is a lovely carol, it's Once in Royal David City. We'll stand as we worship. <laughs>
first lesson is from Isaiah, is Isaiah chapter 9. We'll read verse 2 and then verses 7, 6 to 7. An hour, we'll read that for us. The people walking in the darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and withholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's all pray. Father, we thank you that 600 years before you came to be born in that stable in Bethlehem, Isaiah spoke, didn't speak so much how you were going to be born and where that would be. That was going to be Micah who was going to say that. But he speaks about your character and who you are. That you're the great counselor. You're mighty God. The prince of peace. And this side of Bethlehem and this side of the cross we're able to agree with that. We thank you for who you are and we thank you for what you've done and what you've brought to us this day. Be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If the children would want to go out now, it's been good to see you and uh, you can slip out. Our second reading is from Luke's Gospel. It's Luke chapter 1. And we'll read verses 26 to 35 and then verse 38. And Lorraine will read that for us. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Why will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. <coughs> so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. We're going to sing again. It's a lovely hymn. It's Away in a Manger. Let's stand as we worship. Thank you. 
third lesson is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and verses 3 to 16. And Elizabeth, read that for us. The birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. Amen. The angels were saying, this is good news, and we know it's good news. We, we love uh, to celebrate Christmas. But of course, life carries on, and lots of things happen at Christmas. And just because it's Christmas doesn't mean that life will always be happy. And uh, I don't know if you heard the news on Friday, a, a man was coming home uh, from his worst Christmas party uh, and was killed. Uh, that actually is Emma's uncle. And uh, he was just coming home looking forward to Christmas, and, and this has happened. So we're going to be praying uh, for others, but particularly for uh, Emma's family at this time. Let's come before God and let's pray. Father, we read this story and, and we love this story. And this story has lots of happy memories for us. But this story is set in history. And because it's set in history, it's set in real life. And therefore, real life is all about the troubles of each day. It's about joy and happiness and sadness and loss all together in one place. And as Elizabeth read that passage for us, it reminds us that, that Caesar Augustus decided to have a census. Not so that he might count the people so he knows how many people he should be looking after. But he counts the people so that he knows how many people he can tax. And so the census was something that no one was looking forward to. It was hassle and difficult. And Lord, we know that people went to their place of, of, of birth. And they were going there with a sense of dread. Recognizing that once this census was over, that they were going to be so much more... Uh, out of pocket and, and poorer and life will be so much more difficult for them in the midst of the difficulty Jesus is born and Father we come and we recognise that this Christmas time 2000 odd years after the first Christmas time is exactly the same there's things to be looking forward to we're all looking forward to Christmas day to enjoy being with family and friends and enjoying the meal and gifts but that's all in the midst 
of real life, of, of joy and of sorrow, of celebrating new birth and grieving over loss. And we want to pray again, Lord, for this neighbourhood. We pray, Lord, that when Christmas comes on Friday, that, Father, you may bless Sydney. We pray that people might know your goodness and your grace. And that, Father, they will have a sense of what is really important. For Joseph, it wasn't the census. It was the birth of Jesus. And so, Lord, help people to recognize on Friday that what's important isn't what you're eating or who you're with, but it's whether they have a relationship with you or not. And we recognize the world doesn't seem to be interested in that, just as it didn't seem to be interested on that first Christmas morning. <clears throat> but we thank you it was still good news. We want to pray specifically for Emma's family. Lord, we know that her aunt and her cousins are grieving at this time. <clears throat> Lord, we know that they are devastated as they were expecting Gerald to be home. They knew he was out enjoying himself at the work's Christmas party. And they knew that he'd be home late. But they weren't expecting the knock on the door and being told that he wasn't going to be coming home. Lord, we ask you to be with them. We know that this will be a terrible Christmas for them. In their hearts, there'll be a horrible sense of loss as they grieve someone whom they loved and respected. But we pray, Lord, that in the midst of this darkness and of this sorrow, that you may speak, that you may bring to them comfort, that you may bring into their lives light. Lord, you tell us that you've come into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You have come into a world of sin and you have brought peace. We were reading in Isaiah just a few moments ago that you are the great counselor, that you're the mighty God, that you're the prince of peace. And we want to claim those promises for Emma's family at this very sad time. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our fourth lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew. It's chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And Liz is going to read that for us. The Magi visit the Messiah. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, 
they returned to their country by another route. Amen. I'm going to sing again, and it's good Christian men rejoice. We'll stand as we worship. readings so far have been pointing towards the birth of Jesus and then it's been telling us about the birth of Jesus. Our final reading this morning is telling us the meaning of the birth of Jesus and it's John chapter 1 and we'll read verses 1 to 14 and Betty will read that for us. The word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things was made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. <coughs> children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born for God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Before we, we think about all those things, we're going to sing again, and it's, all oh, come, all ye faithful. Let's stand.
Well, yesterday was called Panic Saturday. The reason for that is lots of people were going daft to do or finish their Christmas shopping, or hopefully finish their Christmas shopping. I'm not sure if you're finished or not. Hopefully, uh, you're almost there if you're not quite there. But I love Christmas. I love giving presents, and I love receiving presents. And for years, uh, I, I, I received lots of good presents over the last number of years. But I used to receive a present from my mother-in-law that I dreaded every year, every year. It was always the same size, it was about that size there. What she used to do, I'm convinced, I never asked her this, but I'm convinced what she used to do, she used to go and walk about town until she could look for the most old fashioned man shop that she could find. And then she would go in and she says, do you have a jumper that you've never been able to sell? Do you have a jumper that nobody would ever wear? And the guy would say, well, actually, way down in the basement, I might have a jumper. But we don't even bring it out to light because it's such a horrible jumper. Every year she could find a shop with one of those jumpers. And they were awful. As soon as the charity shop opened after Christmas, that's where that jumper went. And I never wore any of her jumpers. Never wore them. She had no taste whatsoever when it came to choosing men's jumpers. But my sister, so, so that jumper, that thing that I used to get, this jumper, was something that I didn't look forward to. And, uh, and you always were praying that actually you would get a robber in and they would steal one present, and, uh, but it never ever happened. And, but then my sister, I've got three sisters, and uh, my, one of my sisters, the middle sister, Maureen, would always send me something that I always enjoyed. She would go into a shop and she would say, I've never asked her this, but I'm sure she does, which is, what's the most quirkiest thing that you can sell me? And they would bring this quirkiest thing out and sell it to her, and then she would send it to me. Uh, it, it was usually some sort of book, and it was the most unusual book. Sometimes, quite often, it, it used to be, it hasn't been for a number of years, it used to either be the Bruins or our Willie, plus a few, a few other things. So my sister's great, and, and, and I got the present the other day there. I haven't opened it, but it's a book. And I can assure you it'll be the oddest book. It'll be the, the 10 most fascinating facts about snails or something like that, and with pictures. And, uh, and so I, I like that. That's quite a good thing to open up, and I always have good fun. And I've got a collection of these weird books. If you ever want to borrow them, come and see me. But it's nice to give, but it's also really nice to receive. And it's nice to receive a present that you really like. As I say, socks or ties or jumpers, particularly jumpers like my mother-in-law used to get. You received them and you pretended to like them, but really, no big deal. If you never ever saw it again, you wouldn't be worried. What present, what gift could we bring to God this Christmas day. What could we give to God that God wouldn't say, all right, that's fine. You know, that's, that's what they always give me, but they, they, they don't really give it to me. What can we give to God? And I thought, for to think about that, I thought, what gift did Jesus give to God on Christmas day? Because we all talk about the gift that God gives to us, and we looked at that uh, a couple of weeks ago, how God gives to us the gift of his son. And giving us his son, he gives to us dignity. He gives to us eternity. He gives to us clarity and he gives to us salvation. So we looked at that, about what God gives to us on Christmas Day. But what does Jesus the Son give to God the Father? Well, reading the Gospels, I think it's obvious. What Jesus gives to the Father is righteousness. What Jesus gives to the Father is obedience. We know that because the, the day that he's born, the angels cry out, you know, glory to God in the highest, and to men, peace and goodwill. The angels are glorifying God because of the birth of Jesus. We know that because at the very beginning of his public ministry, for, for the last 30 years or so, uh, he's been working uh, with his father Joseph and the family business. Uh, that, that's what we believe he was doing. But as he, as he comes into his public ministry, what we call his public ministry, for about three, three and a half years, at the very beginning of his public ministry, before he does anything else, he's baptised by John the Baptist. 
which is a really strange thing. And John thinks it's a really strange thing because John understands what his baptism is about. His baptism is all about repentance. It's all about preparing the people for the coming of the Messiah, preparing the people for the coming of the kingdom of God. And therefore he's saying to the people, you need to be baptized, you need to repent for your sins, so you're ready to receive the kingdom of God. So you're ready for the coming of the Messiah. And in that context, then Jesus comes and Jesus wants to be baptized. And John says, what's, what's that about? In fact, I need to be baptized by you. you can't, I, I cannot baptize you. But Jesus insists, and the Bible tells us that Jesus is baptized. And we know that the reason Jesus is baptized isn't because he's repenting of his sin. It's because he wants to associate, he wants to identify with the people that he's come to die for. And in that identification, as, he, as, he's, as he's baptized and comes out of the water, the Bible tells us that there's a dove comes down from heaven and then there's a voice, the voice of God the Father. And what does God say? He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, when he looks at the son, he thinks, oh, that's my son. I am so pleased. Just the way that whenever you receive a gift on Christmas Day, and it's exactly what you want, and you're pleased. And so when God looks at Jesus the son, it tells us that he's pleased with what he sees. Because from the moment he's born to this point in his public ministry, where he's about to start his public ministry, Jesus has shown righteousness and obedience to the Father. And more than anything, that's what pleases Jesus. That's what pleases God the Father. And then we we'll read about the Gospels and all that Jesus did. And we know that Jesus did lots of great things. He, he healed many people. He taught great things about God and, and the kingdom of God. Uh, he ministered to people at the very point of their need. Ministered to people at the point of their need that they didn't even imagine could happen. Remember when that man was sitting at the pool of Siloam and, and he says, look, I've been sitting here as if for 34 years and, and I can't, any time the water stirs, I can't get into the water. And Jesus says, do you want to be healed? He says, yes, I do. He said, well, I want you to pick up your mat and go. And the man is healed. After 34 years of sitting by the pool, he's healed. The man didn't expect that at all. The disciples didn't expect that. Lazarus is four days in the grave. And he says to Mary and Martha, trust me, you know, he will rise again. Oh, we know he'll rise again in the day of the resurrection. In other words, they're talking about the day that God will come. And he says, no, 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 no. <clears throat> And then he calls out Lazarus. And not one person expect, expected him to come out of the grave. And he came out of the grave. They were amazed. And he, for, the la, for the last three and a half years of his ministry, he's been doing lots of things like that. And now near the end of his ministry, we read how Jesus is talking to the disciples. And then he takes Peter, James and John and he goes up the mountain. And while he's there, He's transfigured. They see something of his glory. And it's amazing. But not only do they see something of his glory, but there's a voice from heaven. And it's the voice of God the Father. And he's talking to the three disciples. And he says, I want you to hear what he is saying, talking about Jesus. And I want you to obey what he's saying. For this is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. At the end of his ministry, because shortly after that, after a few days after that, Jesus is crucified. But at the, at the end then of his ministry, Jesus is saying to the Son and saying to those around him, this is my Son, and I'm well pleased. In other words, the three and a half years he spent ministering to the people, he has shown righteousness and he's shown obedience to the Father. And that's what pleases the Father. And so, what can we do? Of course, none of us are Jesus. Of course we're not. We've been singing that Jesus, who is Jesus? He's mighty God, the Prince of Peace. He's the one whom we worship. We cannot be like Jesus. And yet, the Bible tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, he took upon his righteous body, his holy body, our sin. But he did more than that. <coughs> that 
and itself is amazing. But we did more than that because the Bible tells us not only did he take our sin, but he then gave to us his righteousness. His righteousness. And so when God looks on you and he looks at me, he sees us through the righteousness of Jesus. And so therefore it is possible for us to live in the righteousness of Jesus. It is possible to give something to the Father that when he sees us, he says, this is my beloved child. Because remember what, what Elizabeth was reading there in John chapter 1, verse 12. To those who believed, who trusted in his name, he gave the right or the power to become children of God. And so therefore, when he looks at you, he can say, this is my child in whom I am well pleased. Now, those two sentences or two phrases are so important. We are his child because of our faith in Christ. But hopefully it's the things that we do in the righteousness of Christ that allows him to say, in whom I'm well pleased. And so this Christmas, what can we give to God? We can give to God nothing because God has given to us through his grace, his son and his righteousness. However, surely as his people, as his children, we can give to him that righteousness and our obedience. Surely no longer will we say, oh, I'll have to give more time to God, I'll have to pray more, I'll have to read my Bible more, I'll have to go to church more, I'll have to try and be good more. All of those things are important, but the best thing we can give to God is our obedience. In other words, in every place, at every time, we are a child of God. And so when we come to church, we're a child of God and, and, and we believe who God is and we have God living within us and we say and do the right things. But when we're home or in our workplace or when we go out to socialize and all those other places, we're also the child of God and whom God is well pleased. No matter where Jesus was, whether he was at home as a child or whether he was in the workplace with his father Joseph or, or whether he was calming a storm or feeding the 5,000 or, or being abused by people, he always remained God's blessed son in whom he is well pleased. In other words, in every area of the life of Jesus, he was righteous and obedient. And what we can give to God more than anything <coughs> this Christmas is our righteousness and our obedience and the things that we say and the things that we do and particularly the things that we think. Very often we, we try to say the right thing and, and, and we try to do the right thing. Uh, but sometimes our thoughts are unguarded. And the reason for that is people can hear what we say and people can see what we do, but no one knows what we think. But as Christians, as children of God, then we need to be like Jesus who always said the right thing, who always did the right thing, and who always thought the right thing. That's the best present that you can give to God this Christmas. And unfortunately, Elaine's uh, mum isn't here with us anymore. But the good thing about that is I get no more jumpers, like the jumpers I used to get. And so I know that this Christmas morning, when I wake up, I've got a book to open and lots of other things to open and it'll be something I enjoy and I don't miss the jumpers. But let's this Christmas, as we open up our presents and we have good fun with our family or our friends, remember the best thing we can give to God. Because sometimes as Christians we think, well, we can't give anything to God because he's given everything to us. But wouldn't it be wonderful at each stage of our life, in each area of our life, God is able to say, this is my blessed child in whom I am well pleased. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for the gift that you give at Christmas. Thank you, Lord, too, as we read the Bible, we read about the gift that Jesus gave to you and that when he came to himself, as Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he says, Christ emptied himself and being found in the form of a servant, he was obedient, obedient even unto the cross. And because of that, you glorified him. And Lord, that's the same with us. We, we are found in Sydenham in 2015. 
And wherever we find ourselves, help us to be obedient and righteous. So that one day, when we see you face to face, you will say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in and receive your reward. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Part of our worship this morning, we have an opportunity to present to God our tithes and our offerings. Our final hymn is, is remembering the words on Christmas morning the, the angels sang. It's Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's stand as we worship.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and reign with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.